is that uh, with the law, anybody who is under 16 is legally cannot consent. It's just uh, physical, well, legally impossible to consent if, if you're under 16 years of age, right? So if somebody who's under 16, like 15 year old uh, girl or boy, has consensual, consensual sexual relations with somebody more than two years older than them, like 19 years old, consensual, uh, and no matter how uh, minor or explicit the sexual relations are, it could be uh, touching, uh, that is a mandatory minimum uh, jail term for consensual uh, sexual relations, no matter how minor. So they haven't thought of how to to apply it to these uh, exceptional circumstances, and uh, and there are plenty of circumstances like that where where uh, a mandatory minimum is not appropriate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So eliminating pardons for serious crimes act. Um, so eliminating pardons is is a problem because. If a crime is committed when someone's 18 years old, um, even if it's a very serious crime, uh, when they're 60 years old, this is going to remain on their record. They're also, I, I, it's under something separate, I believe, but uh, they're changing the word pardons to record suspensions. Oh, this is under this act. Uh, and they're also increasing the price from $150 to $600 for a pardon. And I, I work with a population um, that that is homeless and and addict and they're using uh, abusing substances usually throughout their whole life um, and that means that they most of them have been incarcerated at one point or another and watching them go through the process of getting pardons is very very difficult they can't afford a lawyer to support them in this process and upping this price to six hundred dollars would make it impossible for many of them. So $600 to regular folks uh, doesn't sound like a lot of money, um, but for people who have been literally through the ringer all their lives. So people who have, have had uh, hard lives you know, in the criminal system and in their own personal lives, uh, it's, it's really hard for them to, to make that kind of money, to save that kind of money for this. Um, these ones I don't know much about, but I hear they really affect, one of these really affects um, refugee populations and immigrants as well, a few immigrants. Uh, the International Transfer of Canadian Offenders Back to Canada Act, and uh, especially this one, the Supporting Victims of Terrorism Act, Protecting Vulnerable Foreign Nationals Against Trafficking, Abuse and Exploitation Act. Okay, but I want to, the, the reason I'm quickly going through those is because to me and to many people, the the actual crimes, like you were saying, it's it's not it's not that they're not crimes, and we have to deal with these as as crimes. But what the issue is is that under implementing mandatory men, minimum penalties, um, it, it takes the discretion away from our judiciary. And I remember in elementary school, one of the one of the very few things I remember from elementary school is learning about. Our, our system, our democratic system, and how it works, and understanding that the judiciary is separate from the legislature. The mandatory minimum penalties, um, it takes the power away from our judiciary to be able to look at a case and use some really nice words about that, uh, use their discretion. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's one thing, it takes away the power from the judiciary, but what in practice will happen is that in order to get around some of the mandatory minimums, the prosecutors will lay charges which are uh, don't attract those penalties. So you really will not get uh, the appropriate charge laid. Like instead of a sexual uh, assault, the prosecutors may lay or take a plea of guilty to straight assault, cop assault, which doesn't uh, attract the mandatory minimum. So on, in fact, there'll be a lot of charge uh, adjustment in order to avoid the uh, mandatory minimums in my, in my view. Yeah, okay, so that's right, it gives a lot of the power to the prosecutors and also to police as well. 
So I, I, I think of the case, an example where a cop knows a, a lady who's on the street, maybe, she, maybe a, a using drugs and a sex trade worker, say, but she has like four kids. And uh, that cop knows this lady and knows that if he charges her with a specific crime, she's going to go to prison for a certain amount of time. So he might use his discretion and let her off. And on the other hand, he might see someone on the street that he really doesn't like, and he wants to get off the street for the same crime. So he knows that if he, if this person is charged with this crime, they'll be, they'll be in for a certain amount of time. It takes the power away from the judiciary, gives it to, to others. Um, it gives it to the police. It gives it to the police. It gives it to the, to the prosecutors, um, and also, especially, gives it to the legislature, which isn't. The, the job of our legislature to do that. Um, the other thing that I'm going to talk about, and then I'll get you to do the youth because I, uh, I don't want to leave that out, um, is that, and I'm really going to focus on this, going to prison has inequitable outcomes for different groups. So one day in prison for a woman and for a man, for an Aboriginal person and for a youth has different implications. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Oh, okay. Um, somebody in the group sent me that I had trouble even finding the text online, and somebody sent it to me. And the first thing that I I uh, put in the find was detention because I wanted to find out if they're making any alterations to the detention. And the first section it brought me to was uh, detention with regard to youth. And the first damn paragraph I read, poof, big regression. Uh, the original. Uh, legislation, um, section 29, 1 and 2, uh, talks about detention as social measure is prohibited. And it says a youth justice court judge or justice shall not detain any young person in custody prior to being sentenced as a substitute for appropriate child protection, mental health, or other social measures, which poverty should be one of them, okay? But, uh, and then, um, also in section 29.2, it's, uh, uh, I said I have a copy if everybody wants to, so I won't read the whole thing. I, I gave you a pack or something. Yeah, it's in my bag. Do you, can, yeah. do you want to just speak to it? Or? Well, I, I got it to pass out. Oh, okay. I'll grab it. Um, Go on. Okay, so uh, in the existing legislation, there's uh, conditions under which a judge can hold uh, a youth indefinitely and those would include violent crimes or uh, indictable offenses like serious offenses and that, that has to be the base criteria in order to, to keep them indefinitely. The new changes 